SpaceX is go for the orbit entry and landing. Copy, go for the orbit entry and landing. Good news. So again, we are providing continuous coverage of the crew to return. We just heard the crew announce we are go for deorbit, entry, and landing the uh, SpaceX, or not SpaceX, uh, the crew two astronauts confirmed that. And so again, marching towards the 7.33 p.m. Pacific time splashdown, 10.33 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, things continue to go great here, Gary. Um, so uh, yeah. That's a significant milestone, Andy, because what it means is we are now really, the teams are ready to commit to the next couple of dynamic activities. A lot is going to happen once we get past 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, 6.09 p.m. Pacific, we're looking at the departure phase burn. Right now, we're pretty much co-elliptic with the International Space Station. That phase burn will turn us into a phasing that points us right towards the prime landing site, which we just heard that we're go for, which is off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. That's a 42-second burn, uh, and it puts us uh, really in line with that. Uh, it's not too long after that where we'll see the dragon slew for claw separation and trunk separation. The trunk will go off uh, into the distance and burn up in the atmosphere. In the meantime, the, the dragon will reorient itself, putting the uh, heat shield uh, right towards the uh, atmosphere of the Earth, uh, where it will do the bulk of the work of slowing the vehicle down from 17,500 miles per hour to 350 miles per hour. Uh, that, of course, in order to get to that point, we need to conduct a 16 and a half minute deorbit burn. And that really is what commits us to landing off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Even at this point, the teams could, um, even after the phasing burn, uh, look for other opportunities. But with that go, it means that we are very likely going to head towards that deorbit burn here uh, coming up uh, not too long from now. Yeah, and uh, we heard um, about 30 minutes ago uh, that weather, sea states also looked great, and that um, definitely was taken into account before, given the go. So, um, yeah, the astronauts, I'm sure, are ready to go home. And uh, on screen right now, we have a view of them looking at their display monitors. Again, they have access to a lot of information of the vehicle um, that they can use and uh, refer to for re-entry. So you see the display is looking at the ground track. Uh, they have a full map of the Earth, and they're looking at their relative position uh, as they orbit the Earth, which is, at this time, still co-elliptic with the International Space Station. Uh, we'll be getting to that point very shortly where we uh, line up with the prime landing site. Uh, flanking the on each of the screens that were on both of the sides, uh, each respective of the commander and the pilot uh, were was an outlay of where the Draco thrusters were. So they they are able to see the Draco thrusters firing, making sure that they are doing their job uh, with that 42 second burn that's coming up here uh, in just about 12 minutes. After the departure phasing burn, we have one more burn left. You mentioned it. It's yep. the 16-minute uh, um, deorbit burn. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Dragon, once it enters the Earth's atmosphere, there's going to be a communication blackout period for about seven minutes. That, that, what that means is um, the crew in Dragon cannot communicate to the ground, and the ground cannot communicate to Dragon. Um, there is some interference from the plasma that's built up around the exterior of Dragon. Uh, but at this point, the Dragon vehicle itself is really piloting itself. It knows exactly where it's at mm -hmm. um, and knows exactly where it wants to go. So um, it will continue to steer the crew uh, towards the primary landing site. Um, 
uh, while we, uh, again, um, go through that period of high plasma and um, get to the other side and we can get comms up again. After we have an acquisition of signal on the other side of that entry, uh, we'll be able to hear some of the first words from the crew as they are inside the atmosphere of planet Earth. The, depart the deployment of parachutes will happen relatively quickly. Uh, what's scheduled right now is the drogue sh uh, parachutes to deploy. Uh, that will take uh, roughly eight seconds, and then about 40 seconds after that, uh, the drogue parachutes will be released and the four main parachutes will be deployed. Uh, that's, that sequence slows the vehicle down from roughly 350 miles per hour to about 15 miles per hour. Nice and gentle, uh, so the crew, when they land in the ocean, uh, is a nice soft landing. And this here is a view of uh, Mission Control Hawthorne. Team Sierra continuing to support the crew to return. And again, a few minutes away from that departure phasing burn. The teams here uh, handed over to a new shift. There was a shift of flight controllers that uh, looked over the undocking phase as well as the fly around and the exit of the approach ellipsoid, all of which was under joint operations with the teams over in Mission Control Houston. Uh, and then in between that, they handed over to a new shift. These uh, flight controllers are overseeing the uh, phase of flight that we're in right now, uh, which is coming up to be, uh, uh, like as we're saying, Andy, is, is a very critical time with the phase burn. Uh, we're gonna be uh, separating the Dragon trunk uh, committing to a deorbit burn and landing off the coast of Florida. Again, we heard a go for uh, deorbit burn entry and, and landing. Uh, that means that the, cr that the vehicle is healthy, the crew is prepared, the recovery teams are in position, and the weather out in uh, Pensacola, Florida is cooperating. This is one of the reasons why we are doing this indirect handover, uh, is for this moment. Uh, the Crew-2 astronauts uh, undocked before the Crew-3 astronauts launched to the International Space Station, primarily because the weather that was predicted for tonight's landing uh, was predicted to be very, very favorable. Uh, and we're hearing reports that that is true, that the sea states are very calm, the wind speeds are also calm, uh, not exceeding five knots. Uh, the recovery teams are already out there, and uh, we're aiming for our prime splashdown location off of the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Yeah, the um, Corps described it as lake-like, uh, which right. is about the best thing you can hear <laughs> if you're an astronaut coming home. Um, there are a couple things that they look at, so the wave height is important, as well as the period of the waves or uh, how often the, the waves are um, crashing. So again, uh, green on all uh, accounts, really, uh, in terms of sea state and weather, which is uh, great, great, and excellent news. So we're just about eight minutes away from that departure phase burn. It's not too long of a burn, about 42 seconds. On screen right now is the view inside the cabin. Uh, the arm or the hand at the middle of your screen, that is uh, Tomas Pesquet's hand uh, of the European Space Agency. You can see that uh, on his, uh, I believe that's his left thigh, there's a tablet. Uh, that is where um, all of their procedures and instructions and manuals that they can refer to, it's all housed there. And so uh, we heard the core and the crew talking to each other uh, about certain procedures and steps. Uh, they're referring to that inside their tablets to make sure that again, all the um, things that need to be done and all of the um, uh, uh, procedures that need to be accounted for, they're all done uh, when they need to, to be this done. This view is spectacular right now. Just beyond where you see Commander Sheen Kimbrough and Pilot Megan MacArthur, just beyond uh, the pilot, you can see two patches that are two stickers that are on uh, the walls of the inside of the Dragon cabin. That is the patches for the Demo 2 mission as well as the Crew 2 mission. This vehicle being a reflown vehicle. Uh, it flew Bob and Doug just a year and a half ago as part of the Demo 2 mission. That was the first mission 
Dragon, uh, inside Dragon with crew aboard. Just the two astronauts were part of that test mission, stayed on board for roughly two months before returning, uh, verifying that endeavor and, and the operations needed for crews returning to uh, space from American soil was go. And here we are, uh, about to return uh, crew from the International Space Station aboard Crew Dragon Endeavor for the second time. And here's a great picture. Uh, we aren't able to really see uh, their faces uh, with the views that we currently have, but from left to right, Thomas Pesquet of the European Space Agency. We have, uh, he is the mission specialist. Um, Megan MacArthur, uh, who is the pilot. Uh, Shane Kimbrough, the commander of the mission. And then Akihiko Hoshide, who is also another mission specialist. These are the four members uh, that are currently on the spacecraft that are re that is returning home uh, in just a few hours in the same order that they're sitting. You can see from left to right, the order is the same. Uh, flanking both sides of the middle is Thomas Pesquet on the left. You can see on the bottom left corner of your screen, he's mission specialist uh, for this mission. He also commanded the International Space Station for just a little bit at the beginning of Expedition 66. Right before departing uh, the International Space Station, he handed over command of the International Space Station to Roscosmos cosmonaut Anton Shkaplerov. Shkaplerov will remain the commander of the International Space Station for quite some time uh, before he departs and Expedition 67 begins. Uh, so that will be uh, about five or six months from now before that uh, uh, crew, MS-19, uh, departs from the International Space Station, Shkaplerov being commander for that entire period. Uh, right before Shkaplerov departs, he'll hand over command of station to NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn who is scheduled to launch from Pad 39A here in uh, just about two days. We were getting very lucky with some of those views from yes. inside uh, Dragon. Uh, we'll see them periodically as we are able to see them. Uh, as the Dragon orbits the Earth, it catches various ground stations that are able to provide high bandwidth communications and provide that uh, in-cabin video. You can see the crew, really the Dragon is flying itself. So they are just monitoring, they are looking at the different thrusters, they're looking at their trajectory, they're looking at the time. Uh, to make because each of these maneuvers are executed at very precise periods. About four minutes from now is when we're anticipated to execute the departure phase burn. So they're just standing by uh, waiting for that period. You can see the reason that they're suited up is to give plenty of margin, plenty of space uh, between the time that they suited up and some of the more dynamic phases of flight. The suits are not required for the entire journey from the International Space Station down to planet Earth. Uh, in fact, we even saw have a, they had a period where they doffed or took off their suits. Uh, they had a little bit of time to have a crew meal. They had some fluid loading, really just drinking a lot of water in preparation for the uh, 4Gs that they're about to experience. Um, uh, before they had to put their suits back on again. The suits are required for uh, primarily two different phases of flights. First is undocking, uh, and the second being the re-entry phase. Gary, we are less than an hour and a half away. Um, the crew, uh, to, to get home from the International Space Station, it's gonna take about eight hours. Uh, after they undocked, there was a, a, a fly around of the International Space Station, did a full 360 um, sort of uh, um, fly around, uh, taking pictures of the International Space Station before going through uh, all of the departure uh, burns to uh, slowly move the Dragon vehicle away from the International Space Station and to get it closer and closer to Earth. So um, they are well into their journey and um, towards the end here, and we're just under 90 minutes. That's right, so two minutes to go. Let's do a quick recap of everything we've seen so far. They undocked right at time, at, right on time at 11.05 a.m. Pacific uh, Standard Time, uh, backing away to about 220 meters. And then, as you said, Andy performed a full fly around of the International Space Station. It was Thomas Pesquet's job uh, to take a digital camera, point it towards the International Space Station, and photograph the exterior. Uh, this was to allow photographs and uh, visuals of the outside that 
are not normally seen. We have cameras on the outside of the station. The robotic arm is able to survey some areas of the station, but it can't quite get everything. So this was the first um, exterior survey that we've had since 2018 when the Soyuz did a fly around. After that, we uh, executed a series of departure burns. There were five that were planned, uh, departure burns uh, zero, one, two and three, as well as a departure phase burn, which is coming up here in about a minute and a half. Uh, there was another burn that we introduced called the uh, out of plane burn. Uh, this was also a prop dump burn, so it served a couple of purposes. One, uh, using the forward bulkhead Dracos fired for about three minutes uh, and adjusted the course of the International Space Station, also dumped a, a lot of fuel, which is essential to minimize the weight uh, as we enter into the reentry phase of flight. So we just saw the crew, um, they are seated and buckled in into their seats, uh, getting ready for, again, the uh, departure phasing burn. It's going to line us up uh, to uh, our primary landing site, uh, which again is uh, off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Um, this is gonna last about 40 seconds. And um, again, its job is to, to sort of point us, get us out of the plane and uh, direct us to uh, where we need to be for the final burn, which is the deorbit burn, 16 minute burn, that's going to uh, take Dragon out of orbit and uh, start to um, uh, get it to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. So on screen right now, um, if you look on the very right-hand side of the screen, oh, now the left-hand side of the screen, there is, a, there is a hatch there. That is the side hatch that the crew will be egressing out of once the Dragon capsule is recovered out of the water, hoisted onto the recovery vessel. Uh, we'll be opening that side hatch, and um, that is uh, where the, the, the crew will egress from. So there's uh, on screen right now, uh, underneath the um, display panels, there are some buttons. There are also some buttons on the armrests of the chairs. Uh, th uh, some important features, uh, they get dedicated their own buttons, things like being able to cut the main parachute uh, after we deploy them. Uh, communications get their own button as well. Um, and so uh, that is just sort of part of the design of the interfaces that the crew gets to use as part of the Dragon vehicle. This way is right there. They don't have to pull up a different display. They can make that quick action. Uh, of course, the parachutes themselves should automatically deploy. Uh, the whole, really the whole flight is, is meant to be automatic, but having that extra layer of protection, knowing that they are able to simply push a button and execute a very critical procedure uh, so the parachutes don't drag them around uh, in the water, that is a very critical capability to have. If the seats themselves also actually actuate, um, they can uh, be configured to a number of different positions, uh, whether uh, we are uh, preparing for liftoff or landing, and um, it's just to make sure that we orient the uh, astronauts in the most comfortable position, the safest position uh, for those different parts of um, the, the mission. Seats will remain in this position for most of these upcoming uh, activities including the departure phase burn, as well as uh, the trunk separation and deorbit burn. Uh, right when the crew enters into the atmosphere, the seats will actuate. Uh, they'll get into a slightly different position. Uh, right now, this, this uh, position being good for monitoring the uh, 
the the displays and, and having access to them, but the seats will rotate once they uh, start getting into the parachute deployment uh, to brace them for landing. Uh, it'll be slightly more upright, not exactly perfectly upright, but just slightly more upright uh, to allow them to take the loads uh, of that uh, 15 mile an hour splashdown. So after this departure phase uh, phasing burn, um, the next event that's gonna happen is we're gonna be separating the claw, then jettisoning the trunk. So the claw is essentially an umbilical that um, connects the uh, trunk to the capsule of the dragon. So uh, we saw earlier, there was a graphic, um, the trunk is essentially the, the bottom half of the, the, right. um, the, the, the vehicle. It's unpressurized uh, and the crew sits in the capsule. So um, the claw needs to be um, disconnected essentially. Um, that way the trunk can be jettisoned. Um, after we jettison the trunk, the Dragon vehicle is running exclusively on battery power. That means that um, everything, the displays that we just saw, um, everything is internal to the capsule itself. So it's, it's sort of like its own micro environment for the, the, the astronauts to safely return home. That's right. Uh, to separate the trunk from the Dragon, uh, it's going to execute a series of what's called slews. Slews is uh, when some of the uh, Draco engines are firing to change the orientation of the Dragon slightly. Right now, uh, the Dragon is flying uh, sort of uh, at an angle right now, um, but it'll change uh, to uh, essentially move over to the side uh, so that when the trunk separation happens, it's sending over the trunk in a completely different plane. So there's no risk of conjunction with the two um, meeting each other as they enter into the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, after that maneuver, the dragon will slew into a position where it's back at an angle uh, where the um, heat shield is facing towards the Earth so it can make contact with the atmosphere and take the loads that is the really the heat that's going to be surrounding the vehicle uh, it'll be that pika tiling that you were talking about earlier uh, Andy that's taking on about 3500 degrees Fahrenheit as the uh, dragon itself uh, enters through the earth's atmosphere the crew themselves will be experiencing about four G's which is why through a lot of this flight we've been getting regular check-ins with the cargo specialists here in Mission Control Hawthorne making sure everything around the cabin uh, was completely secured because that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of G's you don't want things flying around when you're going through this phase uh, from it'll be about seven minutes that the crew will be in this period uh, where the vehicle will be completely surrounded by plasma so we'll have a comms blackout uh, and we won't be able to hear from the crew from quite some time but this is really critical uh, to, to have a safe re-entry and landing you need to shave off a lot of velocity and right now the crew is going very very fast they're going 17,000 miles an hour orbiting the earth they're in an orbital velocity right now and so the atmosphere will do a lot of the bulk of the work uh, to shave off that speed from 17,000 miles an hour to 300 150 miles an hour. Yeah, and, and um, it does it primarily through friction. So right. uh, the way I like to think about it is if you uh, rub your hands together uh, very, very quickly, your hands start to get warm. Imagine doing that at 17,000 miles, five, 17,500 miles an hour, it would get blisteringly hot. And, and that's really what the Dragon vehicle is experiencing upon re-entry. And all of that friction um, gets converted to heat. Right. Uh, it also slows down the vehicle. Uh, that way we can deploy our chutes and um, get a nice, again, uh, soft landing uh, uh, in the Gulf of um, Mexico. So again, we have a lot of recovery vessels that are ready for that moment. Uh, we're, we're coming up on it, uh, the very dynamic period that's that's coming up. It's, it's just a matter of time before we hear confirmation of some of these critical burns that are gonna be returning the crew home. Um, the recovery assets uh, have been listening along the way. They've been watching the weather and a lot of them have deployed. Uh, so we know that the uh, GO Navigator is out uh, heading towards the recovery site. We know that there are fast boats that are going out as well. They're going to take the bulk of the work once Dragon splashes down to outfit it, uh, to do a sniff check, making sure there's no hazardous gases that are leaking from the vehicle uh, and make sure it's very safe to bring aboard because we have a lot of recovery personnel on board the GO Navigator. There are two helicopters that were deployed from shore uh, not too long ago and are making their way out to the recovery vessel. There's a helipad that's on board these recovery vessels uh, and so they'll drop a lot of the recovery personnel off 
off and uh, head back over to shore. Uh, it'll be some time uh, bef that the teams will be there to be able to um, take the crew off. There's medical personnel there. There's uh, there's uh, representatives from different organizations. We have European Space Agency. We have uh, uh, Jap the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, NASA, uh, and then of course SpaceX personnel all going out to support this landing. And we are targeting um, under an hour after Splashdown to uh, get the Dragon uh, vehicle hoisted up on the recovery boat mm -hmm. and the astronauts out. Um, it is a nighttime recovery, right. and we've done several of these um, already, and it really doesn't um, uh, seem to slow down the recovery operations team. We have spotlights. There's a, a thermal camera that can spot Dragon uh, when it's coming back down. So um, they have all the necessary tools to, again, uh, quickly and safely recover uh, the crew from uh, the, the water. That's right. There's a WB-57 aircraft, too. Forgot to mention that. That has been deployed. Did hear confirmation of that. Wheels up. So WB-57 is on its way out uh, to circle the landing site. That WB-57 is a high-altitude aircraft with very specialized imaging equipment that's able to point at and track the entry of the uh, Crew Dragon as it comes through the Earth's atmosphere, getting some initial data for the recovery team is very critical. Uh, so it'll continue to track that. It'll likely be the first first images that we get uh, from planet Earth of the crew returning back. Uh, and um, we talked about uh, Dragon jettisoning the trunk. The trunk uh, sheds a ton of mass, um, a couple thousand pounds, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the Dragon vehicle itself is uh, also quite massive in right. that sense. Um, when it splashes down, uh, it's actually waterproof and it can float. So um, there really is no risk of uh, water getting into the capsule. Um, there are actually um, uh, bladders effective, uh, effectively where uh, water can be pumped into these bladders to make sure that Dragon um, is, is, is upright. So for those uh, just joining, you're watching live coverage of the return of NASA's Crew-2 mission. Uh, the Dragon Vehicle Endeavor has departed the International Space Station at 11.05 a.m. Pacific Time, or 19.05 GMT, with NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur, JAXA astronaut Aki Hoshide, and ESA astronaut Thomas Pesquet heading home back here on Earth. Following departure, Dragon did its first ever fly around of the International Space Station and then underwent a sequence of departure burns. Since then, the crew has enjoyed one meal uh, aboard the spacecraft and, of course, they got suited up, which you're seeing from some of the views on board now. In this next phase of the mission is when things really get exciting, Gary. Uh, Dragon has a series of steps to complete before returning Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma home. First, Dragon will maneuver to the correct attitude and then jettison its trunk, which is, again, the cyl cylindrical, unpressurized part uh, of the spacecraft. The trunk is currently connected to the aft or bottom section of the Dragon capsule, where the heat shield is located. So in order to uh, expose that heat shield and get the vehicle ready for atmospheric re-entry, will jettison the trunk. From there, the spacecraft will use its forward thrusters to perform a deorbit burn, which will put Dragon on a trajectory to return to Earth. It really commits them to do so. That burn will last about 16 and a half minutes once it starts. And to prepare these upcoming events, um, right now the Dragon capsule is doing a couple of things autonomously. Um, it'll start to isolate the thermal control systems, fluid and uh, thermal control system fluid loops from the radiator. This system is what will help keep the internal temperatures of Dragon uh, temperate for Shane, Ma uh, Ma uh, Shane Megan, Aki, and Toma during re-entry. Uh, Dragon is also initiating separation of the claw mechanism. Again, that's gonna terminate data, power, and fluid connections between the capsule and the trunk. So we're waiting uh, for the next uh, series of steps. First, of course, will be the uh, slewing uh, to separate the trunk. Uh, uh, there will be a claw separation and the trunk will, itself will jettison. And of course, we'll enter into the deorbit burn. We're monitoring to see if there will be a uh, departure phase burn 
I know we're past the point where we were uh, tracking that, but uh, we did introduce, and we didn't talk about this, was uh, an out of plane burn. And it was also a prop dump burn. It fired f the forward bulkhead Dracos for about three minutes. Uh, and so the teams here are analyzing the phasing, and it looks like uh, we'll make sure that uh, there are there is not that departure phase burn, but uh, we may be heading right into the deorbit burn here very shortly. Yeah, so we are expecting that slew, or, or again, the maneuvering mm -hmm. to jettison the trunk. Um, we'll start that in about um, in about eight minutes here, and then the call separation is expected uh, okay. just past 6.30. Uh, so again, Dragon's gonna start to maneuver itself. Call separation comes first, right. and then trunk separation. Right. So again, we are providing continuous coverage. Uh, Gary's been here for uh, the better part of the day, <laughs> all the way going. from undocking, um, and then we'll cover through splashdown and recovery of the team as well. So don't go anywhere. Uh, we are just waiting on a couple of major events here, enjoying some uh, views of the crew inside the capsule, uh, as you can see on screen. Dragon, the orbit sequence start in five minutes. Copy, we're turning.
All right, so we are continuing to track the uh, return of Crew 2 and the astronauts back to planet Earth. Uh, we just heard we are just moments away from entering the deorbit sequence. Uh, we did a quick fact check on some of the burns that we've been monitoring throughout today's flight as we've been providing continuous coverage, and we did get confirmation that that uh, departure phase burn, which we have discussed, takes the Dragon out of the co-elliptic phasing that is really uh, matching the International Space Station uh, with both the perigee and apogee, and puts it on a course uh, with that landing site, which is Pensacola, Florida. That did happen, uh, so so we do have confirmation that all of the phasing burns, the departure burns that are necessary to line Dragon up for the deorbit sequence, which we're hearing is about to uh, take place here momentarily, uh, that we are all lined up. All of the burns have taken place. Dragon is in a good phase, a good position to get ready for this next sequence of very critical events. And what that means is we have just one more burn left, the deorbit burn. Right. A couple of things need to happen, again, before we um, start this. Uh, in uh, about three minutes, we'll begin to maneuver or slew the Dragon uh, to the appropriate um, uh, attitude in order to prep for claw separation and then trunk separation. Mm -hmm. After that, we'll slew back. Um, the, uh, the four forward bulkhead thrusters um, underneath the nose cone uh, will fire for about 16 and a half minutes. That will be what slows down Dragon and brings its altitude down enough to start to um, uh, sort of uh, hit some of the um, uh, atmospheric uh, particles of Earth. And then from there, we'll start to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere enter that blackout period uh, for about seven minutes where there's just plasma being built up uh, around the exterior of Dragon. Uh, so we'll lose communications for about seven minutes. Um, after that, we'll, we'll regain communications. Uh, we have uh, parachute deploys. We have two mm -hmm. sets. Uh, first up is the drogue chutes that will take the Dragon, uh, the Dragon capsule velocity from about 350 miles per hour to 120 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. From there, the uh, main chutes will deploy, taking us from 120 miles an hour uh, down to about 15 uh, mm -hmm. for a nice soft landing uh, on off the coast, uh, off the co uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So that is uh, going to kick off here very shortly. We're coming up on just about an hour from the predicted splashdown time. Uh, we did hear there were slight adjustments in some of the sequence, and that sequence, the deorbit sequence itself, about to begin here momentarily, uh, with starting with the claw separation and trunk separation, but that'll kick off. Once that sequence starts, it's about an hour timeline uh, from the time that that sequence starts to the time that we are in the water. Uh, we're still targeting 7.33 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10.33 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, so... Again, uh, everything that we just talked about is going to happen in that hour. So, right. uh, you know, we, we, we saw the crew enjoy their meal. They donned their spacesuits once again. Uh, and I really had uh, a bit of a respite before right. these dy very dynamic portions of, uh, of the, the operation. So uh, things will definitely get exciting here in the next couple of minutes. And we'll be with you every step of the way. Uh, we're expecting communications with the crew throughout each of these different phases, confirmation of trunk separation, uh, the, claw, the claw opening, the claw separation, trunk separation. Uh, when the deorbit burn starts, it's going to be uh, quite, uh, quite a long time that those forward bulkhead Dracos will fire. It is the longest burn of the entire flight, the eight and a half hour journey from undocking from the International Space Station to splashing down off the coast of Florida, 16 and a half minutes. In this particular phasing, because of the short flight, uh, that is a much longer burn uh, with some of the longer phases when we're talking about 18 or 19 hours. Uh, it gets a lot shorter. Sequence start. There you go. Copy. So uh, again, that was confirmation of the beginning of the deorbit sequence. Again, it involves uh, a, a number of different um, items to, to occur. Right now, again, the, the Dragon is starting to maneuver itself, orient itself uh, to prep for claw and trunk separation. So the first step is the claw separation. Right now we're in the preparation phase. Uh, this is an automatic sequence now that we're in the uh, deorbit sequence, which just kicked off. Uh, it's an automatic sequence that starts with claw separation. 
The claw is uh, essentially the, umbil uh, the umbilical that routes uh, uh, power to the uh, dragon capsule. It's connected um, as part of the trunk. Um, so we'll disconnect that first, um, uh, pop off the uh, trunk, so to speak. And once that happens, the uh, dragon capsule is um, uh, running exclusively, ex exclusively on its own um, internal batteries. Right. And there's plenty to spare, too, through the uh, six months or so that the uh, Dragon has been attached to the International Space Station. It really hasn't had to rely on its own power at all. The International Space Station has gigantic basketball court-sized uh, solar arrays in addition to a couple of new solar arrays that some of the Crew-2 astronauts themselves installed and deployed on the outside of the station, all providing power not only to the International Space Station, but to the Dragon while it's been docked. Uh, during the docked phase, the Dragon itself is connected via umbilical uh, that provides communication and, of course, power uh, to the vehicle. So the batteries were fully charged uh, for the ride home, and then even upon separation, you can see, uh, you were able to see through some of the views, the uh, uh, trunk itself has a series of solar arrays that are on one side of the trunk, able to provide a small amount of power throughout this, uh, these, this uh, phase of flight. We are expecting to get confirmation of claw separation and then shortly after trunk separation. We did hear claw separation is confirmed. Dragon is now automatically uh, going into the preparations for trunk separation. itself. Um, separating it exposes the heat shield. Again, that is very necessary uh, to uh, protect the capsule from uh, the high temperatures um, that uh, it will be experiencing during um, re-entry. Dragon, nominal trunk jettison. Copy, nominal trunk jettison. Great way to start off the deorbit sequence. Um, the trunk is off uh, and everything is uh, going smoothly so far. Coming up next, uh, we're going to be reori reorienting the dragon and then um, starting up the deorbit burn. Right now we are in a slew. So now that the dragon has uh, physically separated the trunk, the trunk has confirmed to have separated itself from the dragon capsule. Uh, that slew had dragon oriented slightly to the side relative to how it is orbiting uh, to allow there not to be a conjunction between the two um, uh, bodies as they uh, now enter into the deorbit phase. So now the dragon itself is slewing into a position with the forward bulkhead Dracos pointing straight on the velocity bar or the V bar, essentially the same direction that the dragon is orbiting, uh, to be prepared to fire the four bulkhead Dracos for 16 and a half minutes. Uh, that sequence should be coming up here in about two minutes. We should be hearing the confirmation that the forward bulk bulkhead Dracos are firing. And we'll, so, we'll, we'll monitor that, make sure that the deorbit bird is good and that we have a good burn. Uh, once that burn is complete, Dragon is committed to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and splash down off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Yeah, that's going to be the last time that we fire the, the forward bulkhead thrusters on the Dragon vehicle. Uh, and so, um, again, after we, we finish the deorbit burn, the nose cone, which is currently open right now, we're going to be closing that. It takes a couple of minutes to close, and then it latches shut. Um, this protects the um, avionics and all of the, um, the items uh, underneath the nose cone, uh, but we'll latch that shut because we're not going to be firing the Dracos anymore. Uh, and then Dragon really will be... Um, uh, on its trajectory towards the primary landing site off the coast of Pensacola. And we're hearing confirmation from the flight control teams here in Hawthorne. The Dragon capsule is now switched its attitude. It's slewed into the deorbit position and is in the deorbit attitude. Now standing by for about a minute from now, uh, where the Dragon itself will fire those four for forward bulkhead Dracos, beginning the deorbit sequence, a very critical part of today's flight.
there. We will be bringing continuous coverage uh, all the way through uh, splashdown and recovery of the crew. On screen right now is a view of uh, Hawthorne Mission Control. Uh, folks are starting to gather around, ex uh, anticipating uh, Crew 2's return, uh, again, off the coast of Florida um, in, in under an hour now. That's right, we are in the home stretch. So it is worth mentioning again that the Dragon vehicle itself is uh, a, a very um, sophisticated, intelligent vehicle. Um, the maneuvers that um, it has been doing throughout its undocking phase and a part of its uh, downhill um, sequences uh, really are autonomous. Um, the crew uh, it, um, are definitely trained uh, to help support Dragon in case um, things go off nominal, but really for the most part, Dragon is piloting itself. It knows where it's at, where it wants to go, and it's making all these minor adjustments um, as needed. So uh, the crew is in good hands. Uh, they are uh, definitely on um, the trajectory they need to be uh, to, to return home safely back here on Earth. So we're just moments away. Again, the deorbit sequence has started right on time. So we had a confirmed claw separation and trunk separation. Dragon is now in an orientation with a forward bulkhead Dracos pointed where they need to be for this very critical burn, the deorbit burn. Uh, we've been waiting for this moment for quite some time. Uh, a lot of the departure burns that we've been following over the past couple of hours have been really in anticipation of this moment. We've been following weather all along the way uh, because once we start this deorbit burn, really there's no going back. Um, that means that the dragon itself is committed uh, to return back to Earth. And confirm that the deorbit burn has started. Initial checks show that the dynamics of that burn are looking pretty good. This is going to be a long burn, 16 and a half minutes. So a quick recap, within the last 10 minutes, a lot has happened. The dragon has jettisoned its trunk and initiated the deorbit burn. Uh, which started now at about uh, 6.40 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. For these operations, Dragon and SpaceX closely coordinate with the United States Coast Guard to establish a 10 nautical mile safety zone to ensure public safety and for the safety of those involved in the recovery operations as well as the crew on board their returning spacecraft. Multiple notices are issued to the mariners in, the, in advance and during recovery operations and the Coast Guard patrol boats are deployed to discourage boaters from entering the splashdown zones. We really wanna to stress to the public uh, the need to respect this safety zone. Recovering a spacecraft from the water is a hazardous operation and any other boats interfering increases the risk to astronauts in the capsule, the teams working to recover them from the water and the safety of those that come too close. For the safety of the crew and your safety, we recommend that you sit back and watch and we'll be bringing you the best possible coverage of our astronauts homecoming. And like I mentioned earlier, this deal burn is the last time that those four forward Draco thrusters will fire. Uh, Dragon Endeavor has not yet entered Earth's atmosphere yet. Um, this deal burn is what will line the vehicle up and put it on its final trajectory to the landing. So to the landing site in the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. So right now, Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma, uh, they're using their screens to keep tabs on the burn durations, uh, Draco thruster firings, and trajectory details like entry angle, capsule perigee, and how much distance remaining until the deorbit burn uh, is terminated. They have access to that uh, with the displays in front of them. Uh, again, Dragon is essentially flying itself, so all the crew has to do is uh, stay strapped into their seats and keep tabs on things. Uh, so we're waiting to hear the call out for uh, nominal burn uh, to confirm completion of the deorbit burn for uh, Dragon Endeavor. That's gonna be coming up uh, in about 12 minutes, 13 minutes. Uh, so still uh, uh, a bit longer to go on this deorbit burn. That's right, we're coming up on about three minutes into the deorbit burn, and it is a very long burn, particularly with this phasing, uh, which is the short trip from undocking to splashdown that doesn't include a sleep period or anything for the crew. They're really in it for the long haul. 
Um, these forward bulkhead Dracos need to fire for about 16 and a half minutes. We've seen very similar profiles for some of the other missions. Crew 1 and I believe Crew 2 had a, had a pretty similar profile, or not Crew 2, um, Demo 2 had a very similar profile, uh, about roughly the same period of time uh, from the time of undocking to the time of splashdown. So it seems to be a pretty popular profile. So we'll just sit back and uh, make sure that the deorbit burn is, is continuing to look good. And so far, teams are tracking that it is. We're about four minutes in at this point, um, uh, which is uh, into a 16 and a half minute burn. And on screen is uh, our four astronauts on board Dragon. Uh, left to right, Issa's Thomas Pesquet. Uh, he is the mission specialist. Uh, then we have the pilot, Megan MacArthur, and uh, the commander, Shane Kimbrough, both from NASA. And then we have JAXA astronaut, Akihiko Hoshide, uh, who is also the mission specialist. So uh, again, they are both, uh, they are all in their suits, um, strapped in and, um, eagerly waiting their, their return and uh, a breath of fresh earth air uh, <laughs> in about 45 minutes. Oh, excuse me, um, 45 minutes until splashdown, then right. about an hour until they can egress the, the vehicle. Each of them has had a long journey on board the International Space Station. They've been in space for 199 days. 198 of those were attached to the International Space Station. Each of them have had very critical roles uh, in the, some of the activities that have taken place on board. Uh, Thomas Pesquet uh, just handed over command of the International Space Station. He was commander for just a little bit uh, for the very beginning of Expedition 66. Uh, he handed, he took over command of the International Space Station from Aki Hoshide, who had it for for quite some time uh, during Expedition 65. He was the International Space Station commander. Uh, of course, we heard that uh, Shane Kimbrough is the commander for the uh, Crew Dragon vehicle, uh, and each of those three have conducted uh, several spacewalks on board the International Space Station. There have been four spacewalks completed uh, that each of them took part in. Thomas Pesquet taking place, taking part in all four of them. Uh, there was one uh, spacewalk that was to set up uh, one of the station's power systems with a modification kit in preparation for future solar arrays. That was done by Thomas Pesquet and Aki Hoshide, the first time uh, that international astronauts not from the U.S. or Russia uh, were part of a, uh, uh, a spacewalk, so they did make history there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Shane Kimbrough conducted three of those himself, uh, so he has nine spacewalks under his belt, and he has... Uh, one of the all-time records for most amount of time in space. For any U.S. astronaut, he's sitting at 388 days uh, of his career total over his uh, three space flights to the, inter uh, well, to the International Space Station and as part of a shuttle mission as well. Six minutes into the 16-minute deorbit burn. We're looking good. Yeah, earlier we had a um, out-of-plane burn and right. uh, that was also used as a propellant wasting burn. And so we dumped a lot of mass with the propellant, uh, propellants that we don't need anymore. That, in combination with the, dr the trunk uh, jettison that we just had, sheds a lot of mass from the vehicle. It actually makes this deorbit burn a lot more efficient, um, so that way um, uh, we can... Um, uh, be as, again, as efficient as possible to slow down the vehicle, bring its altitude down uh, in order for it to begin its re-entry phase. This is a very critical phase. We've, we've seen a lot of action over these uh, past couple of hours as we've been providing some continuous coverage. Uh, it all started with some uh, hatch closure uh, where the Dragon crew said goodbye to the crew on board the International Space Station. Only three crew members on board now. That includes uh, Commander Anton Shkaplerov from Roscosmos, as well as Piotr Dubrov of Roscosmos, and then uh, Mark Vandehei, who is pulling the long haul here. He's going to be on station for almost a year, uh, uh, and he'll be really the responsible for the handover uh, that the Crew 2 astronauts would have done if they were to... Uh, um, have the Crew 3 astronauts arrive before them. But again, we've, we've mentioned this a couple of times, Andy, throughout our coverage. Uh, part of the reason why we're executing a deorbit burn right now, heading for a splashdown off the coast of Pensacola, is because the weather looks really, really good. 
and weather is a uh, is one of those primary driving factors for taking a crew home. Uh, if the weather looks this good with, with very calm, you said lake-like um, states is what we heard on the loops, uh, very calm winds, uh, and of course we, 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 get, we did get confirmation that the skies are clear as well, so we might even get some pretty good views from the WB-57 as well as the ship, uh, the recovery ship, Go Navigator, as the crew is entering. Um, it's, it's really just, it's too perfect to pass up. Yeah, and, and, and that's really uh, sort of the, the, um, the story here. Um, we originally planned to launch Crew 3 right. prior to Crew 2 coming home, and they were going to do the handoff in person at the International Space Station. Weather wasn't quite cooperating with us um, Halloween weekend, uh, but again, Gary, you mentioned this this recovery weather is too good to pass up. Right. And so um, the, the teams that have been supporting this mission, uh, or really both missions, uh, really, uh, this is a testament to their flexibility um, to be able to uh, get this together and make Make sure that the crew too can uh, come home safely uh, in the midst of again this uh, really optimal weather. Very, very true. And and again, we, we are monitoring the weather, and, and it does look good out in the Gulf Coast. Part of the reason that we're uh, landing the crew right now in the Gulf is because the weather over there looks good. And the reason why we're uh, we're going to wait to launch the Crew Three astronauts no earlier than November 10th uh, is because the weather out there is something that we continue to monitor. It's not only the weather out at the uh, East Coast, uh, off the coast of Cape Canaveral, uh, in Florida that we're looking at, but really the weather all along the ascent corridor has to cooperate as well. So that includes all along the eastern seaboard, that includes uh, the North Pacific. All of that has to look good uh, because uh, really in any abort scenario, uh, you'd be looking at the crew um, escaping from the top of the Falcon 9 rocket using those Super Dracos. We were talking about Super Dracos a little earlier uh, and splashing down anywhere along those sites. And so you have to make sure that the weather is cooperating really all along the way. So it's gotta be the right conditions. Yeah, there are... Um uh, multiple teams that plan for all sorts of these types of right. contingencies. It is fantastic when things go well, as we've uh, been seeing for a very long time, and, and we love that. Uh, but uh, we want to make sure that in case um, anything were to go awry, we have plans for that. And weather, again, is one of the things that we need to make sure we pay attention to. So we're about six six minutes away from right. uh, finishing this deorbit burn. Again, this is the last burn for the Dragon vehicle. After this, we'll close the nose cone, flip the Dragon around, and uh, start to head into the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and um, really, uh, after this, it's it's really about 30 minutes, about 40, 30 or 40 minutes until we see the Dragon capsule in the Gulf of Mexico. That's it's right. Gonna, it's going to happen very quickly. <laughs> it is. A lot is going to happen. In fact, when it comes to the parachutes, they are the, that sequence is automatic, but it happens seconds from each other. The, the uh, mortars themselves are deployed to uh, release two drogue parachutes that slows the uh, Dragon capsule down from 350 miles per hour initially. Uh, those are the, the uh, right after we get outside of the blackout zone, which is uh, when the uh, uh, Dragon itself is entering through the atmosphere, engulfed in plasma, so the communications get, can't get through. But uh, right when we exit out of that and we get an acquisition, of signal and are able to talk to the crew inside Dragon again, uh, they should be traveling at roughly 350 uh, miles an hour. But once we deploy those drogue chutes, all of that's going to really happen at about um, 7.29 p.m. Pacific time, 10.29 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the drogue parachutes will deploy, uh, they'll stay out for a little bit, and then 40 seconds later, the, ma the four main parachutes will deploy. Uh, and from 350 miles an hour, with that sequence that's happening really in the matter of one minute uh, with all of the parachutes, that'll gently slow down the uh, Dragon and its crew down to about 15 miles an hour. Yeah, and, and we, we mentioned safety. We've been talking about safety right. throughout this whole broadcast. As soon as the Dragon capsule hits the water, one of the first things that happens is the main chutes get cut. And what this means is um, uh, today there are really no winds, uh, essentially, but um, uh, we don't want, uh, we wouldn't want the Dragon capsule to be pulled by wind in any direction, so we'll cut the parachutes immediately upon splashdown. And there's a, there's a boat that is, uh, part of its main function is to go out and recover that, that parachute. That 
uh, cutting of the main parachutes happens automatically on board of the Dragon. But when we were talking about some of the physical buttons that the crew yes. have on their display panel, one of those physical buttons, which is really important to have instead of having it on a touch screen that you have to navigate to, really easy access to a button that says cut the parachutes. If for whatever reason they weren't to automatically do it themselves, which we've seen on some of the uh, uh, previous crewed missions, they did automatically cut, um, uh, they do have the ability to do so. Yeah, and these parachutes have been tested uh, mm -hmm. hundreds of times. Um, um, and so, uh, you know, the design, uh, parachutes can be tricky, but, uh, you know, we've, we've used these parachutes as a part of all the cargo missions prior to the upgraded Dragon, and now we're using them um, as part of um, this operations too. As you mentioned, uh as the right after the uh, dragon splashes down in the ocean, there are two what are called fast boats that will uh, that are part of the uh, prime recovery team that will immediately go out to uh, the capsule. Um, one of the boats will go right over to the capsule and start out, start outfitting it uh, with some uh, rigging equipment. They'll do a sniff check to make sure there are no hazardous uh, gases that are leaking from the spacecraft, make sure it's safe for the next uh, series of events where the GO Navigator's uh, recovery ship will go out and hoist it onto the ship itself. But you were mentioning the other fast boat. It serves as a backup to that boat just in case it were, you know, some motor function were to happen and, and it can't get out to the capsule in time. But uh, it's prime function. if the other boat is looking pretty good, uh, is to go collect the parachutes. Yes. So again, about about two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, from the, for, the, for the end of the final burn, um, the Dragon and the crew have gone through um, a number of burns throughout uh, today's uh, downhill phase. Uh, so um, again, we are uh, nearing the end of sort of the marathon here. Uh, so this must be exciting for the crew uh, on board the Dragon as well, knowing that uh, this is the last burn that they're gonna feel, uh, last burn that they're gonna hear. And uh, after this, it's really going to be um, a smooth, smooth sailing, uh, so to speak, uh, into the Atlantic Ocean or into the Gulf of Mexico. So the words we're waiting to hear right now are nominal deorbit burn. Uh, those are very important words that'll be uh, sent over to the crew. Right now, the nose cone has been opened to expose the four forward bulkhead Dracos that have been doing a lot of the hefty li heavy lifting with this deorbit burn, uh, pointing straight uh, at the velocity bar, uh, bar. It's a retro firing of the of the. Uh, thrusters to slow the vehicle down and really ultimately make contact with the uh, atmosphere. That's the point of this burn. But um, as long as we have a good burn, uh, it'll be just a matter of a couple of minutes. It's, it's a very quick sequence to close the nose cone. It's a very important function uh, to close the nose cone. It protects the forward bulkhead Dracos. Uh, it protects the docking mechanism that it's been, that's been used to keep Dragon attached to the International Space Station for six months. It protects some of the guidance and navigation equipment of course, this vehicle is uh, reusable. We're seeing it now. This is a reused vehicle. Um, it, it was used originally on, on the Demo 2 mission. Uh, so all critical functions that need to be protected uh, before it slews to the position uh, where the heat shield is pointed right towards the Earth and does the heavy lifting of protecting the, the capsule and, of course, more importantly, the crew inside uh, from the 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit that's going to be experienced as the Dragon capsule enters the Earth. As part of um, the recovery operations yep. uh, after... Um, Tra Dragon, do you have a burn complete? Performance nominal. Nose cone closure has been initiated. Copy all good, the orbit burn. That is the news that we were looking for, Andy. Uh, nominal deorbit burn. Uh, that means that that burn did its job. Uh, you see immediately we're going into closing the nose cone. So now that it's done its job, uh, the forward bulkhead Dracos will not be fired again. We're gonna close uh, the nose cone and protect some of those critical equipment uh, and get the dragon oriented in a position ready for entry. Yeah, so it takes a couple of minutes for the nose cone to close. It doesn't just right. swing shut. Um, and so it'll be closed and then there'll be latches that will secure it into position. Uh, from there, uh, we will slew the dragon uh, 
into his orientation to make sure that the heat shields are, are, are facing forward, so to speak. Um, they will, the heat shield will be what meets the Earth's atmosphere first, it'll absorb and dissipate all of that heat upon re-entry, and then, um, you know, we'll uh, enter our, we'll go through the, the, the blackout period uh, uh, where we won't have comms to, uh, from Dragon to ground or, dra or ground to Dragon, uh, then after that, we'll deploy our parachutes and land. So the atmosphere is gonna do a lot of the work here to slow the vehicle down. We're still close to orbital velocity. Of course, we're a little bit slower because we're dropping in altitude and that is purposeful. Uh, the Dragon and the crew inside is now committed to enter the Earth's atmosphere and splash down off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, Dragon systems look good. The crew is uh, monitoring every step of the way and checking in and saying that they are following closely. Everything's looking good on that end. And of course, the weather is, is cooperating, which is super essential. Um, so we're about to uh, enter into the atmosphere and slow down all the way down to 350 miles per hour. It's gonna be a number of minutes uh, for that procedure to take place. It takes about seven minutes uh, from the time that we enter into the Earth's atmosphere uh, and lose the signal with the crew. So don't worry, um, that is normal. We expect a loss of signal for about seven minutes. Uh, the communications can't get through the plasma that's engulfing uh, the dragon on its way uh, in. Uh, but it should be about a seven minute period, it's predicted, right? So there might be a little extra lag time in there just depending on a, on a series of events, but uh, they'll be calling to the crew at the end of that anticipated period to check in and, and hear uh, how that sequence went and make sure everything is good for the next series of automatic events, which is the deployment of the parachutes and eventual splashdown. Yeah, it is important to note that uh, prior to the deorbit sequence, uh, we did hear communications from the crew to the uh, to the core here. Uh, they were updated on timelines, so the crew uh, onboard Dragon knows exactly what to expect. To yep. they know when the blackout period is going to happen. They know when um, approximately the signal is going to be coming back. And we typically hear pings um, sometimes from Dragon to ground, or and sometimes from ground to Dragon, um, waiting for um, the acquisition of signal. Um, so there are no surprises. Every, every, really every, every party that's supporting this mission is well aware of what is about to happen. So it's gonna be a number of minutes until we actually get into the entry sequence. Uh, right now we're coming up at about 7 p.m. Pacific time, uh, which is 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. It's about uh, roughly another 20 minutes uh, until we actually get into that entry interface. Um, uh, so, so it's still some time. Uh, we, we are right now in a good position with the uh, deorbit burn sequence initiated and uh, it, it puts uh, Dragon in an orientation getting ready. Uh, we can see it slewing now uh, uh, to get ready for that entry prep. Um, uh, really with the heat shield pointed towards the earth. So we're in the final stretch here, Andy. It's, uh, it's really happening. So we should get confirmation, um, uh, if not already, that the nose cone has closed and we are getting confirmation. Nose cone is closed. Mm -hmm. And so again, we are slowing to the right orientation and um, during this, uh, the, for the next 19 minutes or so, yep. Dragon's altitude is decreasing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once we get uh, low enough and start building that friction, uh, we will enter the blackout communication. So around 7, uh, 19 p.m. Pacific time is when we're expecting uh, the blackout communications period. So as we begin the second half of entry, Dragon is now beginning to flush Nitrox into the cabin and continuing to top off Shane, Megan, Aki, and Tomas suits with cool air. Again, this is what we uh, what will allow the cabin temperature to remain comfortable while external temperatures reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That heat shield is pointed forward, uh, leading the capsule to that landing site. Yes, and we are targeting the primary site today, um, uh, tonight, uh, off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, so very exciting, under 30 minutes, or just over 30 minutes, uh, 7.33 p.m. Pacific time is our targeted uh, splashdown time. Right, we did hear that go count call up to the crew that we're still targeting that same exact site, even with a slight shifts in some of the other uh, events, uh, uh, particularly with the uh, acqu um, loss and acquisition of signal, that seven minute blackout period that we were talking about. But uh, all in all, we're still looking at that same time for uh, splashing down uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. 
So stay with us. We're going to continue to provide coverage through this uh, very dynamic sequence. Um, we will, even after splashdown, we're going to remain on air. We want to make sure that the crew is safe once they splash down off the Gulf of Mexico. So once they splash down, it takes less than an hour um, in, in uh, nominal recovery procedures to go out to the boat uh, or to go out to the capsule rather and uh, outfit it to get onto the Dragon Nest, which is on the recovery ship, and bring it in for the hatch uh, opening, the side hatch, and recovering the uh, the crew inside. We'll continue to provide coverage uh, as each of the four astronauts egress or exit from the capsule itself. Uh, we hopefully will get uh, some views of them, uh, maybe pumping fists, or, or as long as they're feeling healthy, of course, uh, uh, we'll get some views of them on the recovery ship. And after that, we are looking forward to talking to some leadership from some of the respective agencies. Uh, we're expecting to have uh, some representatives from NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Japanese, uh, uh, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency call in to provide some final comments now that we have, we can declare a mission success. All coming up very soon, but first we have to pay attention, of course, on the mission itself, making sure that these crew members uh, are about to return to homes, uh, re return back to Earth safely. Dragon, nose cone secure for entry. Endeavor copies, nose cone secured.
Endeavour, SpaceX for entry brief. Yeah, for entry brief. Shane, things are looking really good. No deltas to timeline. Vehicle is nominal, we're tracking no issues for entry. Entry targeting is also nominal. Note that you may see the landing site slightly off in the world view. That is expected and nominal due to the entry purge and uh, entry guidance will clean that up, so that's nominal. There's no deltas to weather. The recovery fast boats have been launched and they're awaiting your arrival. I'll copy. Great news all around, thanks Chris, and uh, we copy all. We copy, thank you. Further affirmation that everything continues to look good. Uh, we did have a successful deorbit burn, and so we're just really in a waiting period right now be before we begin that entry, uh, coming up in approximately 10 minutes, uh, when the crew themselves will enter into the Earth's atmosphere, uh, and uh, the heat shield being pointed in the right direction, uh, and the vehicle itself will slow down uh, over the course of about seven minutes uh, until they get on the other side into the Earth's atmosphere, and we can talk to them again, uh, slowing down from 17,000 miles an hour to about 350 miles an hour. That briefing was spectacular, Andy. Uh, it sounds like the weather is cooperating um, and all of the recovery teams are in place. In fact, the fast boats that we were talking about earlier have already deployed. Uh, we are getting ready uh, to bring these guys home. Yeah, there are really no changes in uh, what uh, we were expecting or yep. what we heard prior to the deorbit sequence. So uh, in that sense, everything was great leading up to the deorbit sequence and everything remains great right now for uh, crew splashdown and recovery. So again, uh, we've been hearing nothing but good news, uh, <laughs> all broadcasts. Uh, we are about five minutes away from slewing right. of the dragon to orient it correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a few minutes after that from um, uh, anticipated loss of signal. Again, that communications blackout period due to the plasma buildup uh, around the Dragon capsule. So a lot's gonna happen. Let's go through the uh, sequence of events here while we have a little bit of time uh, as we're waiting for that slew, of course, and then of course the, the uh, entry sequence itself. Um, once the Dragon slews or orients itself right in the precise position where the um, heat shield is pointed in the right direction, uh, Andy, as you mentioned, we're gonna enter into a period uh, where we will lose the signal. Uh, and that's just because of the plasma that's building up on the outside of the spacecraft. Communications can't get through, so uh, uh, the plasma is building up because we are using the atmosphere itself to slow us down. We're going about 17,000 uh, miles an hour now, and we need to slow down um, uh, quite a bit, uh, eventually to get us to about 15 miles an hour. So the bulk of that will happen uh, during the entry into Earth's atmosphere. It'll, it'll shave off from 17,000 miles an hour to about 350 miles an hour. Uh, from there, there will be a sequence of parachute deployments, first with the drogue chutes. Uh, that'll perform the initial slowdown from 350 miles an hour to, I think it was, you said, uh, about 120 miles an hour. And then from there, it's only a matter of seconds, about 40 seconds after drogue chute deploy, that those will be uh, cut off and the four main parachutes will deploy uh, from the Dragon itself, slowing it down to about 15 miles an hour. We are aiming right on time for a glass-like, uh, I've been, I, we've heard lake, I've, I've heard the word pool, uh, um, uh, wave conditions the out at Pensacola, Florida look absolutely pristine. So, so things are looking pretty good for us so far. So after splashdown, we just heard that the fast boats are on their way to yep. the recovery site. Um, there are two of them. Uh, the first uh, fast boat will um, approach the Dragon capsule that's in the water and do a couple of things. Uh, really, uh, a lot of safety checks to make sure there isn't any ordinances or um, uh, any type of um, uh, chemicals in the air. They'll also do a vehicle integrity check to make sure things are looking great on the vehicle and then give the go for um, the rest of the recovery team to approach the vehicle. The other recovery vessel, um, as long as that first fast boat um, uh, is, is uh, able to do its job, um, the other uh, fast boat will go ahead and recover the main chute that's in the water. Um, if uh, that first fast boat, for whatever reason, motor failure, uh, 
uh, who, who knows, um, cannot do their job, it serves as a redundant uh, vehicle. From there, um, a, um, a rigger who uh, typically uh, approaches the vehicle on a jet ski will uh, approach the vehicle and actually physically climb up on top of the Dragon capsule. Uh, they carry with them a lot of hardware, a lot of hoisting equipment that they'll need to attach to the capsule. And this is really to prepare the vehicle to be, again, lifted out of the water. There is a larger reco recovery vessel that has a, um, a, a sort of hoisting a, a crane of, of sorts on the back right. of it, and there's a platform or nest um, that the uh, recovery vessel will uh, hoist the, the Dragon capsule out of the water, place it on the nest, secure it in place. From there, a couple more checks will, will happen, and then we can uh, finally get to see the crew egress uh, the Dragon capsule. That's right. The nest itself moves a little bit Dragon further in. SpaceX for crew entry preparations. Hey, SpaceX, our tablets are secured, the frames are tight, and visors are down. We copy all, thank you. Approximately four minutes, three zero seconds until anticipated calm blackout. We'll see you on the other side at 0326. Copy 0326, talk to you then. Four minutes, three zero seconds takes us to 720. Uh, right on the money, 7.20 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8.20 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so that's uh, the calm blackout that we were talking about. It's a seven-minute period where uh, we're really in the atmosphere at that point. The heat shield is doing its job of dissipating the 3,500 degrees of heat that's surrounding the vehicle at that time and slowing the vehicle down, down to uh, 350 miles an hour. So, so everything is happening right on cue. 7.20 p.m. is when we're expecting that loss of signal. It is an estimate, um, so there might be a variation of a couple of seconds, couple of minutes. We'll stand by for that seven minute period. Uh, so we'll be looking at uh, approximately 720 uh, to 727. Yeah, and again, as we get closer to the end of the blackout communications period, we will be, we, we typically hear um, the either Dragon or Ground pinging each other to make sure um, that they do have signal acquisition. So um, again, seven minutes um, and, and we'll be with you uh, the entire way uh, for signal acquisition. Uh, shortly after that, the drogue chutes will deploy. That, that happens at about 18,000 feet. Um, and then at 6,500 feet, that's when the main chutes deploy. So we, we talked about um, uh, deployment in terms of speed. Right. Uh, but um, uh, there are sensors on the Dragon vehicle that detect both velocity and pressure. And they, they know basically exactly when to deploy. Um, so again, the Dragon vehicle, super intelligent and uh, uh, basically pilots itself. Um, that's why even through this blackout period, um, the Dragon knows where it's at, it knows where it needs to go. Uh, so the crew is, is in good hands. An automatic flight all the way. It really started uh, about eight hours ago uh, when the uh, Dragon itself, uh, more than eight hours ago at this point, undocked from the International Space Station, the Zenith port, uh, and backed up to about 220 meters, an automatic procedure, uh, followed by an automatic fly around. In fact, the crew were really hands off throughout that whole period. Uh, the commander, uh, Shane Kimbrough, and pilot Megan MacArthur were in their seats monitoring the entire procedure while Thomas Pesquet was at the forward window that was pointed right at the International Space Station, taking pictures for about an hour and a half as it uh, circled the International Space Station. We got awesome pictures of the International Space Station. I'm anticipating, I haven't seen them yet, but uh, we, I'm definitely looking forward to them. Uh, all of that was automatic. Uh, and then of course the departure burns that got us to break away from the keep out sphere and the approach ellipsoid uh, that surround the International Space Station and get us into uh, 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 lower altitude, about 10 kilometers below the station, which we were at for quite some time, uh, followed by the departure phase burn. Uh, we had a good trunk jettison, claw, or claw separation trunk jettison, and then of course the super important deorbit burn, all right on time. Uh, this has been a fantastic flight so far. So we are just 25 minutes away from splashdown. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, we are entering, going to be entering that blackout communications period, but uh, 
once we're on the other side, so to speak, of that, things happen very, very quickly. Drove shoots deploy, main shoots deploy, and we're in the water just a few minutes later. And you mentioned, Gary, um, the WB-57 is right. up in the air. It is equipped with um, uh, imaging technology that will be able to get pretty much the first views of the Dragon capsule uh, on its return back to Earth. So we do expect to see uh, that great footage here in a couple minutes as well. We're about 30 seconds from the anticipated loss of signal. Uh, this is really the beginning of a seven minute period where the crew themselves will be, okay, we're, and we're hearing from the Dragon teams here in Mission Control Hawthorne, they're starting to see some drag, so we are now making contact with the upper limits of the atmosphere right now. That's gonna be uh, slowing the vehicle down quite a bit, now seconds away from the anticipated loss of signal. So we're in the expected period now. That was uh, the anticipated loss of signal. So, so the clock starts uh, approximately now uh, until about 7.27 p.m. Pacific, 10.27 p.m. Eastern. Uh, now in the blackout and entry period. And we did hear that, uh, we did hear some initial confirmation from the Dragon teams here. They're starting to see some drag. Um, so uh, we'll see the vehicle slow down here quite a bit. During this re-entry phase, the team is going to be experiencing um, deceleration. Uh, right now, they're going through that, uh, as well as when the parachutes deploy. Uh, the seats actually will rotate themselves to about 26 degrees to make sure that the crew is oriented properly for when um, the, the chutes deploy. So uh, the, the, um, during the downhill phase, uh, very similar uh, G-forces experience, about 3.5 uh, to maybe anywhere uh, to like 4.5 Gs. Right. Um, so uh, uh, the crew is, is definitely going to be anticipating that, and that's, that's definitely part of their training and, and knowledge. So we're standing by. Uh, we did, uh, we are in the blackout period right now. Uh, this blackout period expected to last an additional six or so minutes uh, until we hear some of the first calls from the crew inside Dragon, now slowing down from 17,000 miles an hour to about 350 miles an hour when we hear them on the other side of this blackout period. Again, we have a WB-57 high altitude aircraft that has deployed with an imaging system on board to, to get those initial views using infrared cameras that are on board. So even though it is nighttime, uh, as long as the vehicle is able to identify and track the vehicle, which with the infrared camera will be easy, just look for the hot thing that just came from the, uh, uh, from the atmosphere. Uh, it'll be able to get those initial views and uh, confirmation of the status of the vehicle, the very first confirmation, which is very critical to the teams monitoring the operations. And of course, the recovery teams that are out in the Gulf right now, fast boats have been deployed, so we got confirmation of that. Uh, the helicopters have landed on the Go Navigator uh, recovery vessel, and the teams are on the vessel right now, uh, getting ready to uh, welcome the crew on board once the uh, fast boats get out to the capsule and rig it with some of the equipment that's necessary to hoist it on board using the A-frame on the Go Navigator spacecraft. Uh, we are really in the critical period right now, just uh, eagerly awaiting, I think all of the teams are, uh, the comms uh, at the end uh, when we have an acquisition of signal from the crew uh, and some of the first views of the spacecraft itself and uh, confirmation of the next sequence of automatic events, which are the deployment of the parachutes. Yeah, and the Earth's atmosphere certainly does make it easier for the WB-57 to spot the hot thing. It is uh, uh, excess <laughs> of 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, so right. it should be able to spot it in the sky. There should be nothing else like it right. uh, at this time. Uh, we're, again, a couple of minutes away from um, starting to exit that uh, phase where we're, we're seeing a lot of plasma, and so uh, we are expecting um, pings 
uh, from Dragon or Ground uh, to try to get that acquisition of signal. So again, uh, I mentioned uh, things are gonna be happening very, very quickly as soon as we get out of here. Garrett, we are under 10 minutes until <laughs> splashdown. I cannot wait. Uh, this is a very uh, dynamic period, so we are listening very closely uh, to all of the different sequence of events because as you're saying, Andy, a lot is going to happen. We're more than halfway through this uh, expected blackout period, uh, an expected seven minute period. Of course, there might be some variation, but uh, we're expecting an acquisition of signal and initial communications from the crew uh, before we see uh, uh, the deployment of the drogue parachutes and and, uh, and main parachutes. There's about, uh, maybe about two minutes difference from when we should first hear from the crew themselves at about 7.27 and about 7.29 p.m. Pacific is when uh, we should see the uh, drogues and the main chutes deploy. And again, I, I say both of them at 729 because that's how fast that sequence is. Um, it's about uh, eight second deployment from, uh, of confirmation of the drogue shoots themselves. And 40 seconds later, the, shoot, the main shoots are out. It's very, very quick. Really, any any minute now, we are expecting um, anticipated acquisition of signal uh, to reconnect that communications line between uh, the spacecraft and uh, the folks here on the ground at Earth. From this moment in time, about a minute left in the anticipated period. Again, it's not it's not an exact science. Um, there might be some variation. We might hear from them early. We might hear from them late. It just depends on a couple of different factors. Uh, but we're all eagerly at the edge of our seats right now, just uh, standing by, waiting to hear from the crew. So far, things looking good. And we'll continue to track it as we enter the final moments of this blackout period. We're getting WB views, the first views of Crew Dragon. Look at that tail. That's the 3,500 degrees. Yes. Look, look for the hot thing, right? It is the hottest thing in the sky right now. Uh, that is such a, it's, it's literally lighting up the Endeavor, sky. Endeavor, SpaceX, come check. Beautiful, beautiful. And Dragon, we've got you. Expect automated parachute deployment, and we have you on visual. Automated shoots. Wonderful to hear from the crew on the other side of the blackout period, the WB-57 high altitude aircraft providing that thermal imaging. We saw the tail of the entry of the vehicle itself. Absolutely Dragon, beautiful. GPS converge, expect nominal altitude for drogues. Copy GPS, nominal altitude. So again, nominal altitude for drogue deployment. That happens at about 18,000 feet. Uh, again, good news after good news, Gary. Uh, things are looking great for crew to return. I am loving this flight. That uh, that altitude expected one minute from now. Right as anticipated, Andy. Dragon, brace for drug window. The thermal imaging system on board the WB-57 is getting us great views of the capsule, but should give us equally good views of the drogue deployment expected seconds from now. Capsule is traveling about 350 miles an hour. 
and the drogue shoes job is to slow it down to about 120. Drogues deployed. Confirmation. That'll slow us down from 350 miles an hour to 120 miles an hour. Dragon, video on two healthy drogues. Does that rate nominal? Copy, great news. So in about 30 seconds, the main chutes are gonna come out. There are four of them and they deploy at about 6,500 feet. Oh, Gary, look at this. This is an excellent view of the drogue uh, parachutes. Here it is. Drogue separation, main chute deploy. We'll wait for confirmation of four healthy mains. Copy 1,000. You really can't ask for anything better. We got confirmation of, uh, you heard on the loops there, four healthy mains. Descent rate is nominal. That means we are expecting splashdown three minutes from now. Visually, you can see one of the mains uh, taking a slightly longer to inflate. Meters. But the teams are, uh, are tracking that as a nominal inflation rate, uh, and the descent rate is as expected. We do have four healthy mains, and we are expe expecting an on-time splashdown. Six hundred meters. We copy six. So 600 meters. This is a better shot of those four healthy main parachutes attached to the Dragon spacecraft Endeavor as it continues to descend. 400 meters. The rate is as expected, 400 meters from splashdown. Three hundred meters. Two hundred meters brace. We copy two hundred embracing. Standing by for confirmation of splashdown. Copy, we heard the main. Endeavor, on behalf of SpaceX, welcome home to planet Earth. Hey, Chris, it's great to be back to planet Earth. And thanks to SAE and Jackson teams. Uh, it was an honor to represent you and work with all to our family. Look forward to seeing you soon.
Splashdown confirmed at 7.33 p.m. Pacific, 10.33 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Four astronauts of Crew 2, Shane Kimbrough, Megan MacArthur, Aki Hoshide, and Thomas Pesquet now safely returned to Earth. Confirmation that the main parachutes have been cut, and you can see from a thermal imaging camera that the fast boats are already on their way to meet up with Crew Dragon Endeavor. Now splashing down off the coast of Florida for the second Space time. Two, three, we think we're... Hey Shane, you're coming in broken, but we see stable one. Copy, great news. Stable one is the configuration that we were hoping for. Stable one means it's in the ocean upright and as expected. So the teams have been uh, ready and waiting about three nautical miles away. SpaceX Endeavor, we're gonna raise our... And Dragon, please repeat. Yeah, we're gonna raise our visors if you guys are doing that. Hey, go for visor raise. So it looks like the astronauts inside are gonna be lifting those visors. Uh, the recovery team has been uh, waiting about three nautical miles away. So it is gonna take them a little bit of time to make their way to Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma inside of Dragon. Uh, quick rundown of what is to come. Um, so about a minute and a half after a splashdown, uh, Mission Control here in Hawthorne will give the go for safe approach. About two minutes away, uh, two minutes from uh, splashdown, the approach boat begins its inspection. Uh, we are expecting that um, ordnance and hypergol check to complete around the L plus 12 minute mark, mm -hmm. around the L plus 30 minute mark. Dragon, SpaceX, come check. Endeavor has you loud and clear, SpaceX. We have you loud and clear as well. We stopped the boat, we have you much better now. So some good comms checks uh, on screen right now. That is the Dragon capsule in the background, uh, upright and stable in the Gulf of uh, Mexico and uh, there's a boat that is heading towards it. So um, at about L plus 30 minutes, uh, the Dragon rigging uh, will be, is expected to complete. Again, rigging is where um, a, a, an employee as part of the recovery team will physically climb on top of Dragon and attach hardware necessary to hoist Dragon up and out of the water. Recovery ships um, also arrive at this time um, at L plus 38 minutes. Uh, that's when we're expecting to lift Dragon out of the water. Uh, L plus 40 minutes, Dragon will be on deck of the recovery vessel. And then at L plus 48 minutes, we are expecting Dragon hatch to open and the crew to egress after about six months uh, in space. That is the goal, to do this in under an hour, and it seems like the, the crew is right where they're supposed to be, right on time. We're getting thermal images of uh, the uh, fast boats out near the Crew Dragon Endeavor in the uh, wonderfully smooth waters of the Gulf of Mexico, as predicted which is fantastic. Um, you can see there's two boats that are out towards the recovery vessel once we uh, get a, a smoother lock on the vehicle itself. One of them collecting the parachutes, uh, the other uh, doing some of the rigging that you were talking about, Andy, which is uh, super critical to the next series of steps. Um, Dragon, SpaceX is go for recovery personnel to approach. Expect personnel alongside momentarily. Okay, copy that, we're ready. So we should see one of the fast boats go out really right next to the capsule. And uh, Andy, you were describing this a little bit earlier. We'll see um, some personnel climb on board. Um, that rigging equipment is hardware that they have on board and they have to attach certain things to certain areas um, because the 
recovery vessel itself, the Go Navigator, uh, is also moving out to... Dragon, SpaceX, request permission to come on board via display cam only. You're yeah, welcome on board on the display cam, SpaceX. We copy, thanks Shane. So the teams here in Mission Control Hawthorne will get a peek inside the vehicle itself, um, watching over their shoulder. The, the crew themselves really uh, are just in a waiting position. Um, their seats were rotated uh, for shoot deployment and for splashdown. Uh, so they're in a slightly more upright position, although they're not completely upright. It just helps that help them to brace. Uh, you heard that a couple of times over the drag and the ground calls, brace for those shoot deployments and for the splashdown itself. Uh, but really they're in just a waiting posture at this point as the uh, recovery teams do their job. It'll take the Go Navigator recovery vessel, which we're getting some of the images from right now, um, the thermal images. Uh, it, it takes it quite a bit to get out to the capsule itself, about 30 minutes, but, which is why we have the fast boats. The fast boats doing a lot of the uh, work ahead of time to prepare it so that really when the Go Navigator arrives right next to the spacecraft, it is ready to hoist onto the recovery vessel and onto the Dragon Nest. You can see that each of the boats are outfitted with uh, spotlights to make sure that they can, again, do all of their functions uh, properly as if this is a nighttime recovery out on the East Coast. But it looks like they have plenty of lighting. And this is the second time that this particular capsule has landed. Right. Um, so this, this capsule Endeavor was used as part of the Demonstration 2 mission last year, uh, Flying Bob and Duck, and it has splashed down and been recovered once before, so uh, this is not its first rodeo. Really a testament to uh, the capability of these American spacecraft that are rotating crews to and from the International Space Station as part of these expeditions. It is truly an international team. From the camera views that you're seeing right now uh, on board the Go Navigator is uh, teams representing NASA, SpaceX, European Space Agency, and the Japanese uh, Exploration, uh, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, all of them on board. Uh, truly an international uh, government and commercial joint effort to make something like this possible. So this is this is the um, first fast boat. Um, right now, it is uh, essentially doing safety checks, uh, making sure that ordinances and hypergalls are uh, still not persisting in the area immediately around the vehicle. Um, they're also uh, doing um, essentially a an inspection of the capsule itself to make sure that it, integrity-wise, it is good uh, before we start to. Um, again, rig the equipments for hoisting later on tonight. So again, it's it's gonna take some time. We're shooting for less than an hour to bring the Dragon uh, Endeavor onto the recovery ship and to uh, open up the hatches and egress the crew or take them out and bring them onto the medical facilities. I can only imagine the views that were possible from right there in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, let's see, we do have a call in from Leah Cheshire, uh, NASA Communications, who's on the Go Navigator recovery ship and was able to uh, witness the re-entry and splashdown of Crew Dragon Endeavor. Leah, if you can hear me, tell us about your experience in, uh, witnessing Dragon Endeavor splash down, uh, bringing a crew home from the International Space Station for the second time. Gary, I can only, I can hardly explain how amazing this experience has been. Right now, as you said, I'm on Go Navigator. Right now, I'm at the 
looking forward to the fast boat, fast boat, fast boat, boat, fast boat towards the spacecraft. Um, we were standing on top of the helipad where we just landed at about 9 p.m. Central, or 9 p.m. Eastern time. And seven. We stood back of the helipad watching the crew members streak through the atmosphere. It truly looked like a meteor, and actually at the exact same time we saw the crew members, we did see a meteorite in the sky. So it was an incredible moment, um, and I was standing next to NASA astronaut Shannon Walker, who she herself just completed this journey six or seven months ago as a member of the Crew-1 uh, spacecraft and mission, and so it, it, it's been an incredible night here, although now the beer, we can't ask for better conditions. It's uh, wonderful temperatures. The sea is very smooth and, and glassy almost. And so uh, things are just moving really smoothly here, and teams are, are executing everything necessary on the board. Leah, tell me what's uh, happening uh, as you are witnessing it. Uh, you, you mentioned landing uh, uh, not too long ago, about an hour and a half ago, on the recovery ship. Tell me what the teams have been doing. We, we witnessed the back end of that with the recovery boats deployed. Uh, what's been happening in preparation from your perspective uh, to get ready for this moment? We saw the fast boat and a jet ski pull up next to us, uh, pretty near us, as we waited for the capsule to re-enter the water. And I actually have a very good visual of the capsule right now. Um, and since that time, there have been several people on the ship, um, just making sure that all of the hydraulics and everything are ready to go to lift Crew Dragon up into uh, the nest that is on the back of the ship. And you'll see that as it pulls toward the platform that they will egress. Uh, they'll then move into medical checks. So teams, all the team members here on the boat Dragon, are here, SpaceX uh, for staff a couple update. of flights tonight on the helicopters, and uh, they're ready to jump in. Go ahead for status update. Hypercall sweeps and unfired ordnance checks are nominal. Rigging is in progress. Approximately two five minutes until capsule lift. Stand by for a PMC as our next step. to five minutes before lift and standing by for PMC. All right, we're hearing private medical conference coming and up. Maybe we can uh, hold for a minute if you'd like, uh, just to finish the uh, set phone ops if you'd like. Sounds good, I will call you back in one minute. All right, and we're hearing those uh, the, the crew sounding healthy from, from inside Crew Dragon Endeavor, walking through the final steps, getting a private medical conference. Leah, one more question before we let you go and, and uh, witness some of the next uh, series of events. Uh, of course, we're going to be following all along the way, but after the crew uh, enters into the uh, um, GO Navigator vessel and, and does those medical checks, what are the next steps to get the crew uh, home? Uh, either in Houston or in the European Space Agency. It is an incredibly excellent process. Uh, so the crew members, after they've completed those medical checks, they will board a helicopter right here on the boat uh, within just a couple of hours of splashing down. And once that takes off, uh, they will board a NASA jet, which will take the back back to their respective hometowns, especially those families that have been on and their mission on the International Space Station. Uh, everything is going okay. and I can't wait to have Leah Cheshire, NASA Communications, thank you for joining us and, and telling us a little bit about uh, what's happening there at the recovery site. Best of luck to you. All right, that was Leah Cheshire on board the uh, Go Navigator recovery vessel now heading back uh, to inside the Crew Dragon. We're getting those views right over the shoulder. The crew standing by, helmet visors up, uh, really just in a waiting posture as we're uh, uh, waiting for the fast boats and the teams out there to rig the Crew Dragon Endeavor with the proper equipment to hoist it, the capsule itself up onto the GO Navigator spacecraft where you just heard uh, Leah Cheshire and the uh, remaining recovery teams uh, are waiting uh, for, of course, the series of medical checks and, and of course, the personnel representing each of the space agencies, NASA, uh, European Space Agency, JAXA, as well as SpaceX.
So again, as expected, Crew Dragon Endeavor splashing down off the coast of Pensacola, Florida, right on time, 7.33 p.m. Pacific time, 10.33 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. An incredible journey. We got a fly around of the International Space Station documenting the exterior of the orbiting complex with digital photographs. Uh, the first time we've done that since 2018 with a Soyuz survey uh, that was done. A lot of elements of the space station have been added since, so we'll be able to document that and check on the status of areas that can't normally be seen by some of the exterior cameras, uh, as well as the robotic arm. You see, we are getting uh, views from inside capsule Endeavor. Uh, the crew really just poised, seated, uh, with their seats rotated slightly upright. You can see they still have uh, access Try to some of the SpaceX panels. For status update. Go ahead. Boat's turned around and making its final approach to you. Just a couple hundred meters off. Just checking in to see if you're ready for that PMC. We are ready for the PMC. All right, in work. Uh, next person you hear from should be a no. So we just got updates that the recovery vessel is uh, just a couple hundred meters away from the Dragon capsule. Um, and they are gearing up for the PMC, which stands for Private Medical Conference. The flight surgeon uh, will check in with each of the crew members to make sure um, uh, they are doing well uh, as they uh, have just returned back to Earth after 199 days in space. Um, right now, this is a view of the backside of the recovery vessel. Um, that is essentially a crane. Uh, the bottom middle section is the platform or nest where the dragon will be hoisted up and placed upon. And that platform actually will move um, towards the center of the boat uh, mm -hmm. into essentially a platform where the astronauts can uh, step off of. And so, um, Again, the, the, the boat is, is backing up towards the Dragon Cap, so you can see it in the background there, and um, it'll uh, uh, hook up all of its lines to the rigging equipment that the rigger is currently attaching on the spacecraft, and uh, we'll hoist it up and get it on top of the recovery vessel. We are not too far away from the Dragon spacecraft. It's right off of the aft end of the recovery vessel itself. So right as expected, it was about, a, it was expected to be a 30 minute Carry transit. SpaceX, I'm back with you. Yeah, about a 30 minute transit Happy and uh, they got there in 20. I think a big part of, of this is you look at the seas right now and uh, there's effectively no movement, Gary. Uh, Leah described it, uh, uh, witnessing it firsthand, it is glass-like. Pristine, yeah. Um, which makes really for the recovery operations uh, just that much uh, easier. Really one of the very critical reasons why we are in an indirect handover posture. Again, the Crew-2 astronauts landing in the Gulf of Mexico before Crew-3 launched, it was really for, for this reason. It was because uh, the weather at this moment in time was predicted uh, to be as smooth and uh, uh, as fantastic as the uh, weather predictions forecasted. So again, the uh, crew is uh, had a private medical conference that was uh, an initial assessment before uh, the docks on board have access to pull them out of the spacecraft. They have a pretty good idea of what to expect whenever they pull them out, so they'll, they'll know the, uh, the right uh, pr um, uh, precautions to take and what's needed for each individual crew member. That, of course, privatized because of the medical uh, reasons. Um, but. Uh, that is why we have medical personnel on board the recovery spacecraft, medical facilities on, on board, uh, I'm sorry, not the recovery spacecraft, the recovery vessel, and med medical facilities there as well. Uh, and of course, it'll be a time for the docs to do those initial checks uh, before they, uh, what's anticipated, will fly each of the crew members out on a helo uh, back to um, 
back to shore where there are planes staged for them to bring them back home. It's not going to be a very long transit at all until we have some crew members uh, back home. Uh, Shane, uh, Kimbrough, Megan MacArthur, Aki Hoshide all uh, planned to go on a NASA plane back to Houston. They'll land in Ellington Field, uh, not too far away from the Johnson Space Center there, uh, where they'll get to meet up with their family and friends, of course. Uh, Thomas Pesquet will board a separate plane and head over to Europe uh, for the facilities over at the European Space Agency to do something similar. So we're continuing to provide coverage, uh, even though the Crew Dragon and the and the crew inside have splashed down safely in the Gulf of Mexico at uh, right on time, 7.33 p.m. Pacific, 10.33 p.m. Eastern. We'll continue to provide coverage until they egress or exit from the spacecraft itself. And once all four crew members are on board, uh, we're expecting to get some calls from representatives of each of the space agencies of the astronauts that are on board, Crew Dragon Endeavor now, NASA, uh, JAXA, and ESA all calling in to provide some remarks after a successful mission and return of all four crew members back to planet Earth. This here is a live view inside of the Dragon capsule. The crew members are uh, inside, and, and really, Gary, as you mentioned, they are just uh, waiting for the recovery team to do their job, uh, hoist the Dragon out of the water uh, before they can egress the vehicle. From this view inside Crew Dragon Endeavor, over on the right side, Megan MacArthur, the pilot for the Crew Tube mission, you can see that little black antenna sticking out from her seat. She's on a satellite phone right now talking with the uh, teams over in Mission Control Houston, getting confirmation that everyone's saying hi to the crew, checking in. Sounds like they're doing very well. If you remember back in uh, the Demo 2 mission, it was a test mission for crew, we're using Crew Dragon Endeavor, but really to verify that the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon was ready to carry crews as part of regular crew rotation missions to and from the International Space Station. As part of that, they used the satellite phone uh, as one of the checks and measures to ensure that the crew had the capability to use the satellite phone uh, to call the various teams and report statuses. Uh, it was um, uh, really a precaution and one of the test objectives of uh, the mission itself. Now continuing that uh, here on Crew 2.
and now the recovery vessel is that much closer to the Dragon capsule. Dragon, SpaceX for status update. Go ahead, SpaceX. Breaking is complete, or approximately five minutes until capsule lift. Copy. So you can see the person that is on the capsule itself. That is the rigger. They, uh, we just got confirmation that the rigging has been completed. Uh, now they are uh, essentially um, securing the, the Dragon capsule to all of the rigging hardware that was attached to safely lift it up and out of the water and onto the recovery vessel. And we're seeing motion of the A-frame now getting into position. The rigger making the final attachments necessary memory serves me right from previous recovery missions, the rigger will uh, jump off the capsule into the water uh, and make his way back into the recovery or, or into one of the fast boats after uh, he's done with this work. Dragon, SpaceX, brace for capsule lift. Copy, brace. There he goes, as expected, jumped into the water. His job complete, attaching the uh, all of the connection points to Crew Dragon Endeavor, making sure that it is stable as the A-frame itself, using hydraulic lifts, hoists Crew Dragon Endeavor out of the water onto that circular frame there you see at the base of uh, the ship. That is the Dragon Nest. And Gary, we are uh, in a in, in a slightly we're slightly ahead of schedule. We were expecting Dragon uh, lift to begin at L plus thirty eight minutes. It is L plus thirty minutes now. Uh, so things con things continuing to go smoothly as part of Crew 2's uh, return and recovery. Seem to get better and more efficient with each <laughs> mission. Dragon, welcome aboard the recovery vessel. Personnel are completing final checks. Stand by for translation to the egress platform. Copy, glad to ready for the translation. All right, with that, we have confirmation that uh, Crew Dragon Endeavor is on the Dragon Nest. It has been hoisted from the Gulf of Mexico and put onto the recovery ship. 
where you saw the dragon be gently placed is called the dragon nest. That whole section of the ship will be uh, translated or moved in uh, further into the ship uh, to allow access to the side hatch. That'll be the next uh, very important critical series of steps. There's personnel there that will um, work on the hatch to eventually open it. It'll be open for the first time in 199 days. Uh, and we'll get the first uh, glimpses of the crew inside. We should be able to witness the egress operations as well, each of the crew members getting out as long as the feeds permit. So we can welcome each of them inside. So for, this, for those of you just joining us, the Dragon capsule has been lifted up and out of the water and is on the recovery vessel. Uh, we just saw a few shots of the crew on board the ship. Uh, what they're doing is uh, securing the Dragon onto the ship to make sure it doesn't move as, it, again, it's being translated or, or moved towards the egress platform uh, where the uh, side hatch will be opened and the crew inside uh, can uh, egress the vehicle. Uh, the shot you see on screen right now is a view inside. It's a live shot of the of inside the capsule. On on the left hand side, that is uh, Commander Shane Kimbrough, and to the right of him is Pilot Megan MacArthur. Uh, what you don't see on screen uh, is to the right of Megan MacArthur is Mission Specialist Thomas Pesquet. Uh, and uh, to the left of Shane Kimbrough is Mission Specialist Aki Hoshide. They've had about an eight-hour journey from undocking from the International Space Station, and now they're on the Dragon, recovery vessel. stand by for translation to egress platform. Copy, we're ready. There's that translation.
Still getting views from inside Crew Dragon Endeavor. This is spectacular. We are less than 40 minutes after the Dragon itself splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico for the second time. Uh, now, just again, less than 40 minutes later, the crew has been hoisted onto the recovery ship. Uh, and the Dragon Nest itself has been translated over to the egress platform. Uh, the next series of steps will be uh, personnel on the recovery vessel uh, that are specialized in opening up that side hatch. Uh, we'll do so. We have medical doctors on board that will uh, take care of them after that. They'll provide initial um, medical care and assessment, uh, egressing the crew from uh, outside the Dragon and putting them into medical facilities that are on board to conduct a series of initial checks uh, before they are flown by helicopter back to shore recovery vessel takes uh, quite a bit of time to get back to shore, so they'll be flown uh, so they can get right on an aircraft and fly home uh, within a very short period of time. Again, we're going to provide continuous coverage until all crew members have egressed the vehicle. We also have representatives of NASA, JAXA, and ESA uh, that are scheduled to be on the line to provide a comments of a successful mission after the crew successfully splashed down, egressed, and are safe on board the recovery vessel. Dragon, stand by for side hatch opening and egress. Next call will be from the recovery team. Crew 2, congratulations. Chris Control, send it off. Hey, thanks again, Chris, to you and your team. We'll see you guys soon. Side hatch is open. You see the waves coming out. Even from inside Dragon now, we're seeing some of the recovery personnel. The first humans that these crew members have seen on planet Earth uh, for 199 days. So I believe the recovery team is checking in with the crews to make sure uh, they're all uh, doing fine. There are, uh, we actually have to remove the footrest underneath the seats um, prior to the crew getting out. It just makes it a little bit easier um, for them to egress the vehicle with that out of the way. We're on a great timeline right now, just 40 minutes uh, after splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico. The side hatch is open, and there are uh, teams inside Crew Dragon Endeavor. That is a pretty quick recovery, not bad. Oh, this is Live a views footage. inside Endeavor. Wonderful. Getting all four crew members thumbs up. They are feeling good. Live streams from on the recovery boat. Spectacular. So you can see some more of the footrests are coming out of the vehicle. 
And once all of those are removed, we are expecting the crew to egress one at a time. So if you are just joining us, uh, left-hand side of the screen, that is the view from inside of the Dragon capsule. Uh, it has been uh, recovered out of the water and is currently on the recovery vessel. Uh, the side hatch is open, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. The recovery team uh, are continuing to um, do some more checkouts and procedures before uh, we start to see the Crew 2 astronauts egress the Dragon capsule.
still standing by for uh, the egress of the four astronauts of Crew 2. Outside of Crew Dragon Endeavor, you can see uh, stationed over to the left there is a stretcher, part of the nominal procedure. Uh, once they are egressed from uh, the vehicle, they'll be put into uh, the stretcher and, and taken over to medical facilities. This is uh, a standard precaution that's been exercised uh, for each of the crew recovery missions so far. First crew member being egressed from Crew Dragon Endeavor. I got witnessed some applause there from some of the recovery personnel as well. It's hard to tell uh, which crew member that was. And we got confirmation that was Megan MacArthur. Uh, that was the pilot of the Crew 2 mission, the first crew member egressed from inside Crew Dragon Endeavor. Next out is uh, Commander Shane Kimbrough. Outside of Crew Dragon Endeavor, being translated over to the stretcher per nominal procedure. Waves, smiles on his face. A fantastic journey. 199 days in space, splashing down on time.
here comes the third member to egress the capsule. This is Aki Hoshide. Some fist bumps and smiles from Aki. Again, after 199 days in space, return to Earth. All crew members flashing the peace sign for crew two. I love it. And that leaves one more member inside of Dragon. That is Thomas Pesquet of the European Space Agency. Here comes Toma. That's the ESA doc on board checking in with uh, Toma Pesquet. There you go. Everybody flashing the crew too. Yes, I love it. Yes. Fist, Fist bumps, bumps, high, and fives. high fives for, pos <laughs> for posterity. So that is all four members of the crew two team uh, safely. Uh, on a boat, I was gonna say on land for a second, right. but they're on a boat uh, and they will um, uh, head to the, all their respective um, uh, places they need to go. But uh, what a great uh, recovery. We, we, we talked about how things were going to speed up um, and, and get more exciting. And that recovery was one of the fastest I've ever seen. It, it was spectacular. I mean, uh, you couldn't have asked for a better mission. Uh, we accomplished everything and everything on time. Undocking right at 11.05. Uh, AM earlier today. We did a fly around of the International Space Station, went su super smoothly, got some fantastic views, even on our coverage all along the way. Um, all of the burns performed as expected. We did have an out of plane burn as well that was introduced just to make sure we were on the right course, but it set us up right for that deorbit burn on time. And uh, lo and behold, as soon as we got out of that blackout period, uh, even a little bit before from the WB-57, that those views of the streak uh, that was yep. the plasma building up on the outside of the spacecraft. We saw that. Uh, we saw all the all great shoots, drogue shoots, main shoots, uh, all deploy with the infrared cameras uh, and lands on a glassy Gulf of Mexico. The waves were, were perfect, no, uh, incredible wind speeds, and the recovery operations went super smooth. All in all, a fantastic mission. So we'll stand by. Uh, we're gonna continue our coverage here for just a little bit. Well, all, of, uh, all of the crew members have uh, uh, egressed and are on the recovery uh, boats, but we're gonna stand by. We're hoping to uh, hear from some representatives from each of the respective space agencies, NASA, ESA, and JAXA, uh, and we'll just stand by and uh, make a connection with them soon. Yeah, so it was great to see uh, all four members, again, despite uh, 199 days in space and coming back to Earth, uh, they came out of the capsule with smiles, thumbs <laughs> up, uh, fist bumps, and so they are definitely in good spirits, and that is always great to see.
So a little bit about what's to come. Um, so again, we'll continue our coverage and uh, hope to hear some remarks from some of the uh, from the representatives of each of the space agencies. Uh, but right now, each of the four crew members are on the Go Navigator recovery vessel. They're going into some of the medical facilities that are on board, and they'll have doctors on board that are able to check them out and do an initial uh, medical assessment, making sure that they're good to go. They're not going to remain on Go Navigator for the entire trip back. They actually have helicopters that are staged, uh, ready to take them off. Uh, there's a helipad on the recovery vessel itself. Uh, so that helicopter will take them back over to shore where they have planes that are staged uh, at shore, ready to take them back to respective locations. For Shane, Megan, and Aki, they'll head back to uh, Houston. Uh, and they'll do some uh, additional medical assessments, some additional tests. They'll get to see their family. They'll get to go home. Uh, in just a couple of short days, they'll be working out. They'll be in the uh, um, they'll be in the gym, uh, getting reconditioned back to, for 1G for life on Earth. Tomas Pesquet will head over to Europe to do the same thing over at the facilities over at the European Space Agency, and that will be a wrap for the Crew 2 mission. Yeah, so they still have a little bit ways to go. Um, uh, after egressing the, the Dragon capsule, but uh, it looks like uh, everything, again, going smoothly, um, especially as part of this broadcast. Again, you, you had mentioned, Gary, uh, everything that was on the to-do list today uh, has been done and has been done on time and, and very smoothly. Wonderful. So uh, we do have some representatives from uh, agencies online right now calling in uh, to make some comments on behalf of the agency. First, uh, we do have Kathy Leaders, uh, who is the Associate Administrator for Space Operations uh, here at NASA. Kathy, if you can hear me, uh, your initial thoughts now that uh, uh, Crew 2 has safely returned to Earth after 199 days and what it means to NASA as a space agency. Well, I'm always amazed I can hold my breath for those last 10 minutes of reentry. You know, I mean, that is um, high drama right there. And like you mentioned several times, seeing those shoots come out is just an amazing thing. It is so nice to see the, that our SpaceX crew two astronauts are have safely splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Florida aboard the Crew Dragon Endeavor spacecraft, and we've now completed the agency's second long-duration commercial crew mission to the International Space Station. And what's it's been such a busy but exciting time aboard the station, and which is really our home in microgravity. You know, I'm so proud of the NASA and the SpaceX team for another successful return. They continue to show that amazing amount of dedication to each phase of the mission and, and just safely and methodically moving forward and conducting the mission. It's just amazing. You know, we originally were planning to launch our Crew 3 mission for a short overlap on station with Crew 2, but, you know, we ended up bringing Crew 2 home first. Um, the team really carefully balanced each decision. And as we looked at which was the safer opportunity, we decided to bring the crew home first, given the weather conditions. And as you can see tonight, they were great. Um, like people said, it was like a lake out there, a very calm lake. So this was a, the best decision we could have made, and it was just great to see the crew exit, exiting that spacecraft this evening. You know, as you folks have talked about, the mission set a record for the longest space flight by a U.S. crew spacecraft. The crew members were actually in their 200th flight day, um, even though they and they did complete 199 full days in orbit, which surpassed the 168 days set by SpaceX's um, Crew One mission earlier this year. Not that any of those crew members count. <laughs> The Crew-2 mission, you know, launched April 23rd on a Falcon 9 rocket from NASA's Kennedy Space Center and uh, and then docked to the Harmony Module's forward port of the space station on April 24th, nearly 24 hours after liftoff. You know, the, the Crew-2 mission has traveled over 84 million miles during the mission while their stay on orbit and completed over 3,000 orbits around the Earth. And during their time on orbit, they have contributed to a host of science and maintenance activities, scientific investigations, technology demonstrations, and multiple public engagement efforts while aboarding the, um, on board the ISS vehicle. 
They've studied how gaseous flames behave in microgravity. And one of my favorites, as an ex-New Mexico person, grew hatched green chilies in the station's plant habitat facility and ate space tacos. They installed free-flying robotic assistants and even donned virtual reality goggles to test new methods of exercising in space, among many other scientific activities. And the astronauts took hundreds of pictures of Earth as part of the Crew Earth Observation Investigation, which was one of the longest running investigations aboard the space station, which contributes to tracking of natural disasters and changes to our home planet. And most importantly, they did that fly around on the way home to have us check out the, the state of the ISS one more time. They conducted four spacewalks to install, deploy, and otherwise prepare for installation of our new ISS rollout solar arrays. And they also saw the arrival of seven spacecraft to the space station and seven spacecraft departing during their six month stay. Station is the hub up there, our, our international hub. So this splashdown of Crew-2 comes just before the launch of NASA's SpaceX Crew-3 mission. I, the, the return looked spotless. I know folks will be wondering about the, that one lagging main parachute and the team will be going off and, and looking at, um, you know, how the loading was on the chutes and understanding that behavior. It is behavior we've seen multiple times in other tests and usually happens when the lines kind of bunch up together until the aero forces kind of open up and, and spread the chutes. And the, the thing that makes me feel a little bit more confident is that the loading and the deceleration of the spacecraft all looked nominal for us, which is good news. But we're making this an exciting week for us. And you know, one of the key things we'll be doing on our launch readiness review for the Crew-3 mission coming up, we'll be working through that. That launch readiness review is tomorrow at starting at 7 p.m. And uh, my uh, OCOM colleagues would, would be kicking me under the desk right now if I didn't tell everybody we'll be doing a post launch readiness review press conference tomorrow evening at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. So once again, thank you for watching. I can't tell you how excited I am to see all four of the crew members back on Earth, and I'm looking forward to launching another set of four this week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy Leaders, uh, Associate Administrator for Space Operations here at NASA. We also have on the line Hiroshi Sasaki, Vice President and Director General for the Human Spaceflight Technology Directorate at JAXA. Uh, Mr. Sasaki, your thoughts on the successful return and the completion of the Crew-2 mission? Thank you for the introduction. Uh, first of all, on behalf of JAXA, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to the NASA leadership, SpaceX, our international partners, ESA, CSA, Roscosmos, and all the colleagues who have devoted to the successful mission while overcoming the tough time under COVID-19. I'm really relieved that all the crew members came back home safely to us, and I do believe they have brought tremendous courage and hopes for all of us through this successful mission. Aki Hoshide served as a commander and led the Expedition 65 and 66 missions over five months. During his own orbit stay, succeeding astronaut Soichi Noguchi, Aki has completed his EVA with ESA astronaut Toma Pesuke and contributed to the upgrade of the ISS, including the installs of MLM. Aki and the entire team faced various challenges during their stay, and they have overcome with great communication among the crew members and with the ground team. It proves us again with the importance of teamwork and international cooperation. I'm also pleased that we JAXA, along with Aki, have conducted various activities to promote space exploration basic research, as well as commercialization of Lora's orbit. Every time 
we see a successful mission like this, we are getting one step closer to achieve our common goals towards space exploration using the gateway and on the lunar surface and also bringing further benefits to Earth through the utilization by the ISS. Next fall, JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata will be on board the Crew-5, followed by Satoshi Furukawa's long-stay mission in the coming years. I hope that the Aki's experience will be succeeded to contribute to our endeavors towards space exploration and human space flight. Once again, congratulations of, to all of you the safe return and wishing the successful launch of Kudu 3. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Thank you so much, Hiroshi Sasaki, Vice President and Director General for the Human Spaceflight Technology Directed Directorate at JAXA. Uh, so that uh, will do it for us. That is the comments that we have from the respective agencies. Thank you so much for calling in and providing those comments. Well, now that Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma are safely back on planet Earth and getting checked out by NASA medical teams and, of course, teams from the respective international agencies, we are going to wrap up our live coverage of their historic return. This all kicked off on April 23rd, 2021 from historic launch pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. After a successful liftoff and separation from Falcon 9, Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma made a 24-hour flight on board Dragon to the International Space Station. Since arriving at the space station, they spent uh, nearly six months as members of Expedition 65 and 66 executing science experiments, spacewalks, and repairs while aboard the orbiting laboratory. And then their journey home began earlier today on the 8th when uh, they closed the hatch to Dragon and undock hours later at 11.05 a.m. Pacific time. After four successful departure burns and a phasing burn to line up their orbit, Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma rested for a few hours before waking up to prepare for re-entry this, uh, this evening. Uh, we, um, excuse me, they didn't rest. Uh, they, they went straight to uh, the- They had a meal. <laughs> they had a meal, basically, yeah. and donned their space uh, we then jettisoned the trunks, the Dragon's trunk, and performed our final on-orbit maneuver, the deorbit burn, at 6.39 p.m. Pacific time to send Dragon on the path home. The spacecraft re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and slowed its descent with successful deployments of two drogue parachutes and four mains, uh, with the final splashdown occurring off the coast of Pensacola, Florida, at 7.33 p.m. Pacific time. Now, following successful splashdown, we saw SpaceX recovery experts move in and prepare a Dragon Endeavor for its lift off, uh, so for its lift onto the recovery vessel. And just a little less than an hour following splashdown, we saw Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma make their way out of the Dragon and into the recovery ship's medic facilities, safe and sound. So they're on the recovery vessel right now. Next, they'll catch a helicopter flight back to shore while they're transferred to aircraft that will take them home. Shane, Megan, and Aki will take a NASA plane for a short flight back to Houston, and Toma will fly back to Europe. And they'll be reunited with their families and then bring this historic flight to an end. It has been an honor and a privilege to share their journey with you all as we continue this new era in human spaceflight, but we have more coming up soon. That is right. Uh, SpaceX and NASA are already looking forward to the next mission when Crew-3 launches, currently targeted just a few days from now on November 10th. Uh, we'll have an indirect handover with three people on board the station for a short period of time as we continue this regular cadence of flying astronauts on American rockets from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, again, it has been an, an, an incredible honor, Gary, uh, and joy uh, to share this uh, mission with the public and all the teams SpaceX and NASA continue to work hard to keep America leading the world in human spaceflight. Uh, continue to follow SpaceX and NASA online and on social media for updates for the very latest on crew and cargo flights uh, to and from the International Space Station. And we'll continue to share the progress of Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma as they travel back home on social media. So we'll say thanks once more uh, for tuning in and cheering on Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma as they return home. And we'll see you again very soon when we'll once again be sending astronauts to the International Space Station from American soil on NASA SpaceX Crew-3 mission. Until then, so long. <laughs>